e abbiamo messo che tutti possono condividere quindi non serve più metterli qua okay, allora, quando apro fa solo un controllo che siano tutti presenti Ecco, sto per aprire a tutti i partecipanti. Vado Moira. Ok. This is just to test. Good morning, good afternoon, buenos dias, good evening. For some, some of you, <laughs> this is just to check if all panelists uh, are uh, are there. Uh, just a quick check, Maria. Yes, I see you. Uh, we can try. We can test the mic. Hello, oi. I'm here. Hello. Maria, Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> 
Good afternoon, Maria. Everything is okay. So you you can share your picture, Maria. Do you want me to turn up or no? Sorry? You want me to try it? Yes, you ah. can. No, whenever whenever we start, whenever yeah. we start and uh, will be your uh, introductory speech, you can share okay. on your Thank you. You're welcome. Then, uh, uh, good afternoon, Marta. Is Marta with us? Not yet. Buenos dias, Monsignor Hector Fabio. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. We are very happy to have you among us today. Thank you very much. Uh, so everything is okay from your side, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah for me, it's okay. Yeah. Everything and this is very well. Thank you very much. Good. Would you have uh, a presentation to share? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. I, I so will share the, 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 the screen. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you too. Uh, then, uh, Sister Maria, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Everything is okay from your side. You can hear us well. Yes, yes. Same. How about you? Fine, fine. Okay, thank so you. So you can share. You can share your presentation from your computer. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good. Agata. Bulani Bulabinaka from Fiji. Good, mo good morning or good evening, Aga. It's uh, early morning. It's 1.30 a.m. <laughs> early morning. Thank you for uh, your availability to be with us. You're welcome. <laughs> this morning. This morning. Um, thank you, Agatha. So even for, for you, you can hear us very well? Yes. Good. Clear. Same for us. So you can share your presentation, okay, from your thank computer. Throw care. She is not yet with us. Excuse me, I have a question. Yes. Do do everything in English, or I will do that. No, no you can speak in Spanish. There will be simultaneous translation, Monsignor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Marit, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Martha is on her way. She had some difficulties connecting. Let me okay. just see if she's... Okay, but do you think we can start first intervention and then Martha will join us? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, here okay, she is. There. Good afternoon, Martha. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine, thanks. And you? Good. We are almost ready to start. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Rita, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine, thank you. So I will, uh, I will start, I will introduce, and then I will give the floor to you. <laughs> Quiva, are you with us?
Okay, just, just a last check. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all well. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> welcome among us. So I think that we can hear uh, you very well. Rita, is it okay for you? You can hear well? Yes, perfectly well. Perfect. Okay. So. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to see all of you to this third appointment uh, with this series of webinar dedicated to women and specifically women and COVID-19. We are discussing together since the 8th of March about the impact of COVID-19. Uh, especially on women, the challenges, uh, but also the aspirations and the added value that women had uh, in the fighting against COVID. At the beginning, we open this reflection with some experiences from areas of major crisis like Venezuela uh, and uh, Bangladesh, and, and with a broad reflection about women and COVID-19. Then in the second webinar, we focus our attention on women on the front line. And we had some important experiences from, from the field that uh, we listened to. Uh, we will uh, uh, discuss about uh, another important topic, women in leadership. Uh, and uh, we will reflect uh, around uh, three main questions. What were the challenges, the main challenges in a leadership position during the pandemic? What we learned from this crisis for a more equal future? And what we can do and how we can do to promote women in leadership position, uh, the specific focus on Caritas. To help us in this reflection and to animate this, re this reflection, uh, we will have a trip around our confederation as usually. And we start uh, uh, by Caritas Europa with an introductory speech uh, of Maria Niemann. Then we will have a special window opened by uh, Marta Skretberg, uh, who will do a, a broad reflection about women leading actions uh, in several contexts. And in the last part, Marta will focus on women in peace and reconciliation, reconciliation processes. And this uh, will open a special window today about uh, women uh, leading and women, the key role of women in peace and reconciliation pro process uh, with focus on Colombia. And we had the pleasure to have among us uh, Monsignor Hector Fabio, and now director of Caritas Colombia, to discuss with us about it. We will continue our trip so going to Caritas South Africa and then uh, to Oceania. Uh, Caritas Fiji to come back to Europe uh, with uh, uh, the CEO of uh, Trocare. So this will be uh, our session uh, today, one hour and a half, we will be, we will be together. I welcome uh, all of you and uh, I give the floor to Maria Riemann, Secretary General of Caritas uh, Europa, who will reflect uh, uh, with us about uh, uh, the role of leadership from her personal experience to go then at the end to some general conclusions. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. Thank you so much, Moira, and uh, good afternoon or good morning for some, good evening for others. I hope you can hear me well because I saw in the chat that there was some comment about that. So 
maybe you can just flag if there's an issue along the way and I'll put on my headphones, but I prefer speaking uh, without. So it's a pleasure for me uh, to make this introductory presentation and, uh, and thanks for inviting me to this webinar on women in leadership. It's such an important topic and uh, it's truly encouraging that Caritas as a confederation has embarked on this journey, on the journey to promote more leadership opportunities for women within the confederation. It will be a great journey. It's the right journey to make and I hope it won't be too long before we reach the final destination, a destination where Caritas is a confederation of equal opportunities and balance in leadership. But I know that the road can be bumpy and I know that there are perhaps some obstacles along the way. So uh, I'm the Secretary General of Caritas Europa since uh, 2019. And uh, it's the first time uh, a woman holds this particular position. So it's a new experience for Caritas Europa. And I shall say straight away that I felt hugely supported along the way. I've been very lucky uh, and I know that my experience is not the same as the experience of many other women within Caritas and indeed outside of Caritas. But I know, um, I also know that there were and that there are many questions uh, and perhaps sometimes feelings of being uncomfortable about the fact that I'm a woman. Uh, and I know that I have to think about being a little more balanced and careful in my approach in men in, than men in a similar position uh, would need to be within a faith-based Catholic organization such as Caritas. I know that I might not be taken as seriously sometimes. And I can live with that personally. Um, and I also see it as an opportunity to help pave the way for the future to some extent. And perhaps I hope to give some hope and courage to the women within Caritas who will be the future leaders. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt this. The, the interpreters are asking if you could put on your headphones. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll do that. So can you hear me now? Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to continue. Hope you can hear me well. Um, so when I was interviewed for this position, I was asked, are you ready being a woman and mother to take on this position? And I think that that question was legitimate because I'm a mother of five children of which the youngest was not even two years old at the time. And the task of Secretary General for Caritas Europa was big uh, and would imply many adaptations. So the task felt big and I felt small and I still feel small by the way. Uh, so the question was legitimate and asked I think out of concern for me, um, although I doubt uh, any father of five ever gets that kind of question in a job interview. But anyway, uh, was I ready? Yes, I said, I think I'm ready, but are you ready? Uh, is Caritas Europa ready to take on a woman who is also a mother of small children as Secretary General? Because enabling women to take on leadership positions is ensuring that there is adaptation from the side of the employer as well, and first and foremost perhaps, that you are not supposed to fit into a frame where you cannot fit in. And I speak of women here, but this goes really for any person. If we want to have an inclusive work environment where people can grow and thrive, then we need to take a close look at how we welcome those persons. What's our human resources policies and strategies? And how have we ensured that there is a true buy-in and support from the governance and from the colleagues? Uh, and I should say that the answer to the question if Caritas Europa was ready for me was immediately yes from the women present. Um, and I want to say uh, also thank you to, to Marta and to Natalia um, in, from Caritas Europa Governance. But there was also yes from the others, although I think that they hadn't really thought of the question and looking at it from that perspective before. Um, so I wanted just to share with you um, a small picture. So I'm going to try to share the screen and I hope you can see the picture. Um, 
So can you see a picture now? Yeah. So I think it, it, it illustrates quite well um, that, um, you know, we have very good intentions and we, we, we think we are equal opportunities employer and we, um, we want to be uh, and we, we think we are ready. But um, if we really want to be uh, inclusive, now are we really? Have we used the tools and taken the steps that are needed to be an equal opportunities employer in practice? Because we cannot expect people to fit into a frame that they cannot fit. So I just wanted to share the screen because I think sometimes a picture says more than, than any word really. So, uh, and how can I stop sharing now? <laughs> Um, ah, yeah, there. Okay, sorry for that. Stop sharing. Okay. So, when I was offered this job, I asked my mom because she has herself been working for the church in a leadership position. What do I need to be aware of in advance as a woman in a leadership position within the church? I was a director also before Caritas, but that was not a faith-based organization. And my mother said to me, well, you'll need a good dose of patience and you need a good dose of humor, she told me, because there will be absurd situations and it's better to laugh than to cry about it and then try to be part of the change. And I think that's been a good advice and I try to implement that, but there are also situations which are not so fun really and where it's just not possible to laugh. But I've been lucky because I know that in many other parts of the Confederation, there will be situations which will be much more difficult, perhaps sometimes even humiliating than I've been part of. And when that's the rule, don't be surprised that it takes long to have equal representation of women in leadership positions. Um, but the truth is that promoting diversity in leadership at Caritas, and indeed at all levels, um, it's not only the right thing to do from an equality perspective, it's also a means to allow our confederation to be more effective or successful, if I may say, because there are so many studies that show that diversity and inclusion are concepts for success because it allows for bringing in the different perspectives and the collective wisdom into the reflection and thus allowing us to be more strategic and to better respond to the needs of the people that we serve. And we cannot afford to miss out on that opportunity. So you will have understood that promoting women in leadership requires more than commitment. It requires concrete actions at all levels, trainings for the managers involved in the recruitment, revision of human resources policies, adapting our way of working to allow for work-life balance. Um, you need to adapt the ways you convene the meetings, you cannot expect your staff to travel or sit in evening meetings without proper notification. You cannot expect 24 seven availability. Our whole humanity needs to be considered and that goes for every person. And perhaps that's one of the good lessons to learn from the Corona crisis that our humanity shone through. We had the kids around us at the virtual meetings. We share the struggles linked to working from home with all the extra work that came with it. I think men and women uh, in many places, we share the same reality. And we saw that there are new ways of working that can make certain things easier and perhaps we're making the work-life balance easier. And that can be implemented for the future. And it's nothing to be afraid of because I think that fear is the biggest barrier and it continues to be the biggest barrier on the bumpy road towards equal opportunities for women in leadership positions in Caritas. And we need to overcome that fear together because there's nothing to be afraid of. We are humanity together and we cannot do it without one another. And that's another thing that this crisis has showed us. So finally, I just wanted to say that mentoring and peer support is hugely important to feel that we are not alone because being in a leadership position can be a lonely place to be. And being a woman in a leadership position in structures where that remains uncommon, such as in the church and in Caritas, that can be an even lonelier place to be. But it can also be a wonderful place to be 
and we need to support one another to make it stay that way to and to continue to pave the way for those who come next with optimism and with motivation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, for this uh, introductory speech. Thank you very much for having shared your uh, own experience, uh, your personal experience. Thank you very much for the call for actions that, uh, that you did. Commitment is enough. We need, uh, we need to act and do better with a special uh, highlight and focus on mentoring and uh, peer support. Thank you again, uh, Maria. And uh, uh, as usual, uh, I invite uh, all of you to share your comments, reflection, or and questions uh, on the chat. Uh, and uh, uh, in between and at the end, uh, we will take some time to answer to the questions, uh, to ask the panelists to do that, uh, or to share your comments. Now, I give the floor to Rita Hayam of Caritas Lebanon to continue moderating this session. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Moira. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I would like to start by thanking Maria for her wonderful speech. Actually, it resonates with every woman who is or was in, in, in a leadership position. And yes, as you said, leadership is lonely. It's even lonelier for women. But as you mentioned as well, it is a wonderful place to be. And uh, I, I really quote you when you said, we need to support each other to make it stay that way, but most importantly, to make it accessible for more women. So as Moira uh, discussed, uh, described today, it's about women in leadership position and with a special segment on women in uh, and their role in peace and uh, peace building and reconciliation. So without further ado, I will leave the floor to Marta uh, Skreteberg, Secretary General Caritas Norway and member of REPCO. Marta will be uh, discussing women uh, leading as leaders uh, in different contexts and a special focus on women, peace and reconciliation. Marta will be speaking in Spanish. Marta, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Rita. I will speak actually in English. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, thank you to Moira and thank you, Maria, for sharing your wonderful experiences. It's a great inspiration for us, uh, the others. So, I will thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak about such an important uh, topic that is women in leadership. I want to start saying that lack of gender equality is not a women's problem. It is a development problem. And as such, we all have to contribute to solving it. The participation and leadership of women in development of their societies is a key if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. Today, I will focus on leadership in the workplace, women in agriculture, and women uh, in peace and security, as uh, Rita said. Reducing poverty and eliminating hunger can only be achieved if every woman, man, girl, and boy has equal opportunities, equal access to resources, and the possibility to participate in decisions that concern them in their households, communities, and societies. Women show great ability to overcome poverty for themselves and for their families, and they are in the front line fighting the ongoing pandemic. They support their families, communities, and countries. At present, there is more acceptance than ever before that women bring different experiences, perspectives, and skills to the table, and make important contributions to decisions, policies, and laws that work better for all. However, persistent barriers still exist in almost all countries to women's participation and leadership. With the pandemic, new barriers have emerged. Across the world, women are facing increased domestic violence, more unpaid care duties, unemployment, and poverty. 
to secure women's rights and take advantage of the potential of women's leadership in pandemic response, the perspectives of women and girls must be integrated in policies and programs at all stages of the pandemic response and recovery. I will now move to leadership in the workplace. I have worked in leadership positions throughout almost all my career in Norway, both in the public and private sector. Norway is one of the most gender equal societies in the world. The great majority of women in Norway uh, work outside the home. However, we still have a very gender divided labor market. Women tend to work in caregiving professions and the public sector, and 39% of them work part-time. Seven out of 10 leaders in the private sector are men, and female leaders still earn two-thirds of what men earn. In my experience, one of the most important ways to shift policy and culture to ensure equal opportunities for women in leadership is to ensure good parental leave policies, both for men and women, full coverage of kindergartens, promoting a culture where domestic and care work at home is shared equally, and setting clear demands of all businesses and organizations regarding equal representation of women in boardrooms. At last but not least, zero tolerance for sexual harassment in the workplace. In addition to strengthening the leadership competence, I think it's very important to mentor women and girls, encourage them to aim high and believe in themselves. As Maria said, the biggest barrier is fear. So, Caritas, I will move to, to women in agriculture. Uh, the reason I will to do is that Caritas, Norway's main sector is food security and agriculture, and we have a lot of experiences in this regard. Uh, since more than one third of women's employment is in agriculture, increasing women's access to land and providing better support for female farmers is essential. Women produce that more than 50% of the food grown worldwide and 70% of food grown in Africa, according to FAO, FAO, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Despite this, they own less than 20% of farmland and obtain lower yields. If female farmers had equal opportunities and access to resources with men, 100 to 150 million less people would be hungry or malnourished in the world. The failure to prioritize women, small scale farmers, is an obstacle not only to the development of women, but also to the development of entire communities. Women strive to own, inherit, and receive credit based on agriculture or property is central to development or in rural areas. In addition, we must support training and empowerment of women in agriculture and promote women's representation in farmers' organizations and collectives. And now I will move to women, peace and security. And I will be brief as Monsignor Hector Fabio Nao from Caritas Colombia will go in depth on this topic. As you all know, Security Council Resolution 1325 from 2000 was a landmark resolution that addressed the issue of women's inclusion in peace and security matters and their participation in decision making processes. A global study done by the United Nations in 2015 concludes that women's equal and meaningful participation in peace and security efforts is vital to sustainable peace. Even though women often face greater levels of violence and equality during times of war and instability, they are at the front line of efforts to lead their communities toward peaceful solutions. 
The 2006 Comprehensive Peace Agreement in my home country, Colombia, set an international example for women's involvement. When talks opened in Cuba in 2012, only one of the 20 negotiators was female. In 2013, civil society leaders organized a national summit of women and peace to demand an inclusive peace process. And by 2015, women comprised 20% of the government negotiating team and 33% of FARC delegates. Norway's role as a facilitator country of the process was key here. I'm incredibly happy that His Holiness Pope Francis, Cardinal Tagli, and our Secretary General Alexis John are all promoting women's leadership. CI has set a concrete objective, a minimum of one third of the members of REPCO shall be women, and there is increased participation of women in governance and working structures at all, all levels. In order to reach this goal, we need to prioritize gender equality also financially. A focal point for gender equality is now in place in Rome, and this to me is clear sign that we as a confederation is moving forward. Dear colleagues, the post-COVID-19 era represents a new beginning and a great opportunity to work together as women and men to include more women in leadership positions at all levels, not only in our confederation, but also where we can influence on other fields. This will benefit our families, communities, and our countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you for uh, shedding the light on the role of women in leadership position, but as well as in agriculture, which is a sector which is a really important one, and as well as on discussing the role of women in peace and reconciliation. And finally, with your uh, conclusion about the wonderful achievement at CI level. Uh, I see that there are many questions, so I ask uh, everyone to, uh, to, uh, to place their question in the chat box so we can collect them. Uh, but because uh, Marta opened the floor to discuss the topic of women in peace and reconciliation, uh, I'm so happy to give the floor to His Excellency Monsignor Hector Fabio now from Director of Caritas Colombia to discuss the key role of uh, women in the peace process in Colombia. And then afterwards, we will answer the questions if there are any. Monsignor, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, Rita. Voy a hablar en español. Es un honor para mí poder estar con ustedes en este día. Agradezco a Caritas Internacionales la invitación que me ha hecho para compartir nuestra experiencia en Colombia. Voy a compartir eh, la presentación para hacer seguimiento de ella. Quisiera comentar que en Colombia hemos tenido una larga historia con el conflicto armado y esta historia nos ha llevado a nosotros a vivir muy de cerca el impacto que ha tenido este conflicto en hombres y mujeres. Inicialmente tendría que decir que las mujeres han sido un sector muy fuertemente golpeado por el conflicto armado. Nosotros alcanzamos a tener en Colombia aproximadamente 9 millones de víctimas, un poco más de 9 millones de víctimas, y la mitad de ellas son mujeres, un poco más de la mitad son mujeres, que han sufrido particularmente por el desplazamiento forzado, los feminicidios, hay un grupo muy importante que ha sufrido también la desaparición forzada, e indudablemente el grupo de personas, mujeres que han sido víctimas de la violencia sexual es muy importante. Esto quiere decirlo porque ha habido un proceso en el cual muchas mujeres fueron abusadas, víctimas de violencia sexual, y eso ha marcado sus vidas, pero ha marcado también su participación en el proceso de construcción de la paz, posterior a la firma de los acuerdos. 
También hay algo que marca mucho y es el hecho de que las mujeres desplazadas, que son un grupo como ustedes ve, pueden ver muy importante, muy grande, tuvieron que asumir roles al frente de sus hogares, cambiar completamente sus roles y eso ha afectado enormemente su identidad por una parte en, en términos de familia, pero también ha transformado de múltiples maneras negativas y positivas la forma de liderar de las mujeres en las distintas áreas en las que nos encontramos. ¿Esto qué significa? Que hemos tenido muchas mujeres que han tenido procesos eh, de desintegración familiar muy fuertes, una pérdida también de lo cultural, de, lo, de aquello que las identificaba y hubo que as, abrir un proceso de reconstrucción de identidades culturales y familiares muy importantes, pero también hay que reconocer los daños morales, socioculturales y comunitarios muy profundos. Esos daños morales marcados muchas veces por la estigmatización de las mujeres, por el hecho de que se las clasificara de una manera u otra, sin tener en cuenta su condición humana y la necesaria equidad que debe haber entre hombres y mujeres en los procesos de salida de construcción de paz. Luego ha habido pérdida de confianza en muchos casos y afectaciones en la vida personal, pero quisiera subrayar las afectaciones en la salud mental. El conflicto crea unas afectaciones particulares y vuelvo a retomar el tema de las mujeres víctimas de violencia sexual, desplazamiento forzado, que han tenido afectaciones muy severas con el trastornos vinculados al estrés postraumático, ansiedad, depresión, múltiples afectaciones. Quería dar ese marco para decir en ese marco muy complejo, donde tenemos millones de mujeres que han tenido que asumir el rol eh, un rol diferente en sus familias y en la sociedad, hemos emprendido un largo camino con ellas. Debo reconocer que el, eh, las negociaciones entre el gobierno colombiano y la guerrilla de las FARC, un grupo de mujeres que jugaron un papel muy importante incluso en la mesa de negociaciones. Aproximadamente una tercera parte de la mesa fueron mujeres de lado y lado, tanto del lado de las FARC, mujeres que participaron activamente en la guerra, como del lado del gobierno colombiano, también mujeres involucradas en diferentes formas de procesos. Y un momento en el cual, como iglesia, tuvimos la oportunidad de apoyar a grupos de mujeres que presentaron sus testimonios ante la mesa de negociación y lo dieron con tal fuerza que fueron capaces de cambiar el rumbo de las negociaciones en un punto muy difícil que es el de la paz eh, relacionada con la justicia y con los derechos humanos. A partir de ahí hemos comenzado un proceso muy eh, lento, pero también con muchos apoyos. Caritas Noruega ha sido un gran aliado en esto, habida cuenta del rol que Noruega ha jugado en el proceso de paz, pero también otras organizaciones de la red Caritas han estado muy presentes. Quisiera recordar que hay un grupo de trabajo Colombia de la red Caritas Internacionalis que ha sido muy fuerte en su presencia en todo este largo proceso y que nos sigue acompañando de una manera eh, muy, muy cercana. Nos seguimos reuniendo dos veces al año. En este proceso, claro que hemos sido afectados también por el, eh, el impacto del COVID y el hecho de que en Colombia, a pesar del COVID, la violencia ha vuelto a resurgir, ha vuelto a recuperarse, eh, digamos, con viol violencia brutal en los territorios y nuevamente muchas mujeres han tenido que sufrir el desplazamiento y otros tipos de agresiones. ¿Qué consideramos nosotros que es clave aquí? Las mujeres han sido definitivas para alcanzar lo que hemos logrado construir hasta ahora en el proceso de paz, en el proceso posterior a la firma de los acuerdos. Las mujeres han hecho contribuciones muy significativas y sin su aporte hubiera sido imposible lograr lo que hemos logrado hasta ahora. Quisiera subrayar que las mujeres han tenido un papel muy importante en el tema de la reconciliación. Su capacidad de entrar en las comunidades, de liderar en las comunidades el liderazgo de las mujeres en el proceso de construcción de paz desde la base, desde abajo, ha sido muy fuerte. 
A veces pensamos que los procesos de paz desde arriba, desde la mesa de negociación, tienen un poder enorme, pero aquí hay que reconocer que el proceso hecho desde la base por las mujeres ha sido de una enorme contundencia. En primer lugar, porque ha facilitado la participación, ha creado una posibilidad de fortalecimiento a las organizaciones de sociedad civil. Y eso significa que hay más mujeres liderando organizaciones de sociedad civil, más mujeres eh, fortaleciendo la democracia y la participación en la búsqueda de salidas. En segundo lugar, porque a través del de proceso que se ha hecho de acompañamiento de grupos de mujeres organizadas, a través del proceso que ellas han hecho en Cáritas, en la sociedad colombiana, se han logrado transformaciones que han abierto la posibilidad a la reincorporación de los excombatientes, una reincorporación con enfoque territorial, es decir, desde los territorios con enfoque de participación comunitaria. Así también lo hemos hecho en la construcción de planes de desarrollo con enfoque territorial y también en los proyectos productivos que adelantamos en Colombia y una cosa muy importante es la capacidad de las mujeres de hacer incidencia dentro de este largo proceso, por colocar su voz y elevar la voz en favor de las víctimas. La capacidad de las mujeres de representar la voz de las víctimas ha sido muy poderosa en la sociedad colombiana. Luego, ha hecho procesos muy intensos, han hecho procesos de formación, en transformación de conflictos, eh, capacidad de las mujeres también allí muy fuerte de transmitir, de compartir y también quisiera terminar diciendo que en este momento tenemos una Comisión de la Verdad en marcha que tendrá que producir un informe este año en Colombia, muy importante y en ese proceso de la Comisión de la Verdad he tenido la oportunidad de escuchar la valentía con la cual las mujeres han colocado los temas que son centrales para ellas hasta este momento en todo el proceso de construcción de paz. Muchísimas gracias. Quedo atento a cualquier pregunta o comentario al respecto. Agradezco nuevamente a Caritas Internacionales por la invitación. Muy amables. Gracias. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you for, uh, for describing the difficult situation in Colombia, but as well the role of women who are overcoming all those barriers. Uh, women as, uh, with their ability to work and being part of the community, women as involved in, in reconstitution of the society, women as overcoming the barriers of prejudice, stigmatization, mental problem, and of their wonderful role in peace uh, and, uh, and uh, in, in building the peace. Um, I would ask Marta, because we have received a question in the chat box, I would ask Marta to answer the question uh, from uh, Helen. Helen is asking Marta, about, uh, Marta, you are having an in, in, in in-depth experience uh, working within the uh, peace process in different countries like Colombia and Philippines. So from your experience, what can CI do in order to get more women both to participate and to come in leading positions in peace and reconciliation processes? Uh, thank, thank you, Rita. Uh, first, I would thank you, Monsignor, for uh, sharing your experiences and um, sound uh, knowledge about the implementation of the peace processes, uh, process in Colombia and um, uh, your insights and how have you been uh, evaluating this, this process. Thank you, Monsignor. And um, yes, to get more women uh, in leader positions, it's a matter who demands uh, different measures. I will lift up, for, in for instance, normative measures, uh, which is related to incorporate, incorporating management documents as, uh, for, in for instance, policies, uh, plans of action, uh, the role of women. In, uh, in, in this regard. So it's very important to, to set up a concrete target, for instance, increase the number of women in the long term, uh, uh, as such uh, Caritas Internationales has been done, done now. So it's very, very important, the concrete objective uh, in this regard. Um, I, I have also to, to 
underline that uh, it's very, very important. Not, it's not enough to set a goal. We have to allocate resources, financially resources to implement this. So I will say, uh, in addition to normative measures, it's important economic measures. And uh, the third one I will mention is the pedagogical uh, approach. We have to uh, invest in education and we have to invest in competence building, in leadership, but also within peace uh, and security. So it's very, very important that we uh, have women in leader position, but not just because they are women, but because they are the best. So it's the education and the competence building is extremely, extremely important. And uh, I, I, I will suggest uh, to the Confederation so to create a joint advocacy strategy uh, that can be used at national, regional and local level, uh, because it's very, very important, for instance, uh, to lift up the importance of welfare schemes in order to promote equality between men and women. So I, I think the Confederation uh, also, also has to, co to cooperate with uh, women's organizations, civil society, and uh, faith-based uh, organizations. So I, I will, I will uh, stop there, but uh, it's thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Monsignor, would you like to add uh, something as well? Thank you, Rita, very much. I, I would like to summarize uh, what I said in Spanish. First of all, uh, it's an honor for me to be here with you today. And the first point is to stress that in Colombia, we have a big number of victims. More than 9 million people have been uh, affected uh, by the um, uh, international conflict. Most of them are women. Uh, in particular, internal displacement has been very hard here in Colombia and uh, other abuses against women like rapes, etc. Se sexual abuses very, very often. They, they suffer in the countryside in everywhere in Colombia. So from that point, I'd like to stress the, uh, how the, what is the contribution of women for peace building in Colombia? First of all, I would like to stress that reconciliation is the main, uh, the, the, the main area where the women have, have been working very hard recently. They are engaged in many, many different processes in the countryside and the, at, the, at the grassroots level. So in the negotiation table in Havana, we had a big number of women working on that. Third part of the negotiation table was women. women. Uh, afterward, we started to recognize that women have a very important role from the grassroots level. Working with victims in particular, they raise the voice in favor of victims to be heard, and particularly uh, working very hard with the excombatants. They are open to receive the excombatants and to have, uh, to, be, to have a very big efforts to integrate them in the, in the, in the life of the communities, the, the, the local communities. So afterward, we had many women working in uh, advo on advocacy. Advocacy had ha played a very important role because the implementation of the peace agreement had been not easy in Colombia. We have very important and very big peace agreement, but the implementation is hard, it's not easy. So women are very engaged to promote the implementation of the peace uh, agreement, in particular the rural development uh, plans what we call the territorial peace. That is very important. They have been working very hard with the local communities. And if you look at very carefully, the local leaders in Colombia, in particular the areas affected by the armed conflict are women. So uh, that is uh, one of the important uh, 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 roles that the, the women have here in our country in this, at this moment. But on the other hand, they suffered a lot, a lot of uh, cultural impacts and they had to flee the countryside due to the conflict. So nowadays, the role of the women has changed. And we are trying to promote 
the, the, their role in the implementation and of, uh, the of post conflict resolution and peace building activities. So we are very committed with that. Uh, we are trying to support and strengthen women's organization in the peace building efforts, providing adequate and sustainable financial and technical support. That is important. It's to support the organization of women working in different parts of the country. And lastly, uh, to, uh, just to end, uh, just to summarize, summarize my presentation, I want to stress that women have been very key for the to strengthen democracy in Colombia. Democracy, we need to overcome the conflict. We need to solve many problems related to, to representation, to participation of the civil society, to strengthen the civil, organi the civil uh, um, the organizations uh, working on peace and human rights. And women have played a very important role on that. Thank you very much, Rita. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Marta. Uh, we will be closing the special session uh, about women in uh, peace and reconciliation. And now we'll delve deeper into the, uh, the uh, women in leadership, especially post-COVID. So we will gonna uh, listen to important testimonies and we're gonna reflect about, as well about how we as Caritas can uh, promote women in leadership position. So um, I will give the floor to, uh, to Sister Maria Rissini, a national coordinator from Caritas South Africa. Sister, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, those on the other side of the world. Um, it is a pleasure and thank you very much to Car Caritas Internationalis to inviting us for to share our experience. So I am the national um, uh, coordinator, we call, uh, of Caritas South Africa. I'm going to share um, a little bit, uh, some of our slides. Let me see if I'm able to. So uh, it makes easy for us to present our topic. <laughs> Let me see here. Can you see? Okay, so um, you see the, the leadership of, uh, of women in uh, mobilizing community, that's what we thought is important to, to share with you during the pandemic, is um, before the, everything we want to, to share where is South Africa, is not some people they confuse with Africa, is inside of the continent of South, uh, South Africa is in the continent of Africa, yes. Uh, but it's in the south. Uh, the population is almost 60 million of people. And then we have a 51,1% uh, of uh, women. I would like to uh, bring, to start our conversation on leadership, uh, some reality of uh, South Africa. So South Africa history shows how women have been courageous, resilient, and part of the struggle, especially during the apartheid. So the apartheid finished in, 19, um, in 94. It was really a long period of time where the women were not allowed to have any public um, uh, leadership. So this is a history that we are uh, now facing in reality. Even though we see, uh, I like now uh, Miriam, that uh, this is a singer, she is also a songwriter, an actress, an activist. If she want to live the experience of leadership, she had to leave the country. And to make the experience of exile is really a big challenge for a leadership uh, women. And she was able to bring a lot of hope to the women in South Africa. Um, and during the COVID-19, we realized that in going through the, the news, each day is bringing to us kind of sadness. The government on gender-based violence and femicide command center alone recorded more than 120,000 victims in the first three months of lockdown. This is really desperating because we see thousands of women being raped every day 
Uh, and before I was saying about exile, uh, we have a lot of um, women searching for asylum seekers in South Africa, uh, being victim of rape and, and so on. Uh, the statistics say that we have 60% of children born in South Africa, they are not living or growing up with their own fathers. Um, this is a photo that um, um, we brought here is uh, myself with another colleague, Sister Clementine. And then just want to share that uh, um, 2020, the year of COVID-19, we were courageous enough to launch the first time the Caritas Day in South Africa. And that was on 15th of November, the day of the poor. The COVID-19, uh, of course, that came alike for you uh, as an unexpected. For us in South Africa, all churches in the country were closed from March 2020 to February 2021. To mitigate the effects of COVID-19 pandemic, the president announced a relief and rescue package that was available only to register South African citizens. The country is home to more than 5 million foreign nationals. Over a million of them are refugees and asylum seekers seekers and thousands are undocumented and stateless, including South Africans. We have many South Africans that are also undocumented. This is a group that are often the most vulnerable and indigent earning uh, their livelihood from the informal sector. And this is the group also coming to our church to, to ask for, um, for assistance. Caritas in South Africa is still in the early stage of structuring in all levels. We started in 2000, practically 2017. I started to coordinate the office, the national office in 2018. The pandemic and lockdown has caused imaginable hardship, especially for the poorest communities. And many small business are still facing uh, bankruptcy. Most of the poor families are deprived of any source of income and are facing famine and destitu uh, destitution. And here I want to call attention that most of the, the families are single mothers. Media uh, reports, they say that more than 3 million South Africans have lost their source of income during COVID-19. So what we did, our own initiative to, to start to, to give a visibility of our work as a leadership of women also in the whole um, country. We, we start with uh, COVID-19 response from Caritas South Africa, as you see the logo there. The National Office of Caritas uh, was able to mobilize 20 dioceses Caritas that uh, have been also very active to attend the cry of the needy and those who were affected. Since the lockdown uh, started, and as I, I said in the previous slide, that many people are being left out from the program of a government, Caritas South Africa submit a project to Caritas Internationalis, which was approved and benefited six dioceses uh, from different provinces for uh, three months. So 12,500 people are being benefited. It, uh, for these 20 Caritas, we have 10 Caritas that they are being coordinated by uh, women. The, South, the SACBC, that is um, uh, also um, the uh, Bishop Conference, they mobilized the, all the Department of Social Action to uh, assist the victim of uh, COVID-19 or they were uh, in need. So now I will uh, ask Ms. Refilwe. She is a coordinator for one of our diocese and caritas, and then she's going to share her experience from the grassroots to, of leadership uh, during the pandemic. 
Um, thank you, Sister Maria, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, Caritas Aluwal North is situated in Aluwal North in the deep rural areas of the Eastern Cape. It is the umbrella body of 10 sub projects that we have. Caritas office has been very active in responding to the cry of the needy in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to share some of the sub projects of our Caritas. The first one is uh, working with the public sector. The Department of Public Health has contracted 272 care workers, mostly women, from Caritas Alwal North to assist as frontliners for the COVID-19 awareness campaign in the region. Their work was to make sure to provide enough information and awareness for the people to prevent the spreading of the virus. The second one, school uniform for stateless children. Aluwal North is a home to hundreds of stateless children. Caritas invested more efforts to assist them, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. The school uniform was handed out on the day of the 106th World Day of Migrants and Refugees. This was indeed a special day to our stateless children as they felt loved and cared for. This was an encouraging, this was encouraging for them to continue going to school and reinstating their hope. The third one, food security and nutrition. From April 2020, Caritas Aluwal assisted a total number of 5,796 households the donation came from different donors in South Africa and abroad. The office is thankful to all the positive response in assisting our needy people in the diocese as our diocese has, has communities that are in the deep rural areas of the Eastern Cape where you find the poor of the poorest. Now sewing machines for the elderly caregivers. 20 sewing machines were bought. The aim was to generate income for the families and to keep them busy during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then women planting vegetables at the community garden. A group of women from the community, they have initiated and volunteered themselves to plant vegetables in one of the Caritas projects. From the garden, they will cook for the orphans and vulnerable children, especially the HIV positive clients who do not have anything to eat before taking their treatment. I must say, with the help and support of the National Office of Caritas South Africa, we managed to achieve a lot. Sister Maria's amazing support is ever noticed. A week never goes by without a call from her and Sister Clementine. And we truly appreciate it. Sister Maria is our source of strength. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rifilwe. Um, I just want to say that the lesson learned from the crisis for, um, that we have uh, um, in South Africa is to understand and give more importance to human beings rather than the, the things. Because sometimes before, I remember that we used to run, run, and we don't stop even to listen to the, to the people. I think this may, made us, Caritas, to listen to the cry of our, uh, the people and the surrounding, what is going on to their families. To benefit of working online, even though that sometimes is really true, that is tiring. But and it's better to, to see the people than to be online. But anyway, this is the way that we learn and we are learning. And this is something important to say that many of our uh, diocesan caritas, they are like us, we didn't know how to use the, the app, how to, to access the online meetings. So that was also during the pandemic, a process of uh, teaching them. 
to change our way of planning and doing our activities. I think this is very important to, to shift to another way of doing things and maybe to not to do the things mechanically, but think our actions. And for us in South Africa, as I said, that we are very new uh, to improve our Caritas Emergency Relief Program. Our very first relief program was with a cyclone in die in our neighbor countries. But now uh, with uh, uh, COVID-19, it brought us really to uh, work and to give a more priority to this uh, Caritas Emergency um, uh, Program. And I want really to thank you uh, for the um, encouragement also. And I must uh, tell you that our Secretary General of SACBC, she served as a Secretary General uh, sister lady uh, for nine years. And now we have a new Associate Secretary General in the conference that is uh, also a woman. We have different departments that are being um, coordinated by uh, women. So I really want to thank you, the bishops, and also to Caritas Internationalis and all the world to think that the women has a special space on, on leadership. And that I think is the future that we have really to uh, believe and to trust. Thank you very much. And we are open for any questions. Thank you, Sister Rizin, for your presentation. Uh, and thank you as well for, for the wonderful work you're doing uh, and for your reflection about how not to do things mechanically, how to improve emergency program, how to give up, to, to listen to humans and to, to put them as a priority and to benefit from all. Thank you as well for the disciplinary approach you're doing. I think that listening to the national office is coordinating with the season office. You're sending wonderful message of how can empower women and are empowering women. So thank you a lot. Um, I will leave the floor now to Agatha Furivai, Director of Caritas and member of the RECO. Um, Agatha, uh, we're so happy to have you with us and Sasha, that this, it's very early morning uh, at your place. So thank you again for accepting to participate. Thank you, um, Rita, and um, good morning or good afternoon to everyone that's in our space. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking from my PowerPoint slides that I have be, um, I have prepared for this presentation. The um, um, PowerPoint slides that I will focus on is the, the beginning from slide three but I want to just show you a glimpse of the women that are in leadership and the group that participates and support our Caritas Fiji uh, uh, network of, um, um, of the women ministry. And um, the background in which I will be talking from is based mainly from my personal perspectives and experiences. So um, uh, to begin, I'd like to look at uh, our leadership role of women and the responsibilities that we play in terms of mobilizing communities in Oceania. Um, women participation, for instance, in Fiji, and I believe in much of Oceania, um, is greater in the development and humanitarian sector, uh, and particularly at the lower levels of communities, from the home, um, um, church, school, and to the cultural groups. So I've included in here our institutions of change uh, where children uh, or families are grounded and much of those actors in this area um, is left to the role of women and so when we talked uh, when we talk of COVID-19 and uh, the impact that it has on, um, on the Fiji community for instance um, we are looking at a situation where it's not really um, um, health as an issue but more the economic uh, and survival of the family um, that became an issue because um, as some of you may have known and the experiences in Fiji uh, is more uh, dramatic uh, is more 
um, in the economic sector. Um, our tourism and hospitality sector suffered greatly. So with the um, uh, turnaround as a result of COVID, more and more people became unemployed, more and more people had less hours to work. And uh, so with Caritas, the Fiji's uh, first uh, response on the field was really for survival purposes. Uh, we found out that uh, a lot of those women um, that were in the areas of, um, of, of working were really trying to make ends meet in their own families. Um, so in terms of the institution of change, I, I see the home uh, where the mother role is, is greatly um, towards nurturing the well-being of children, of family, and in during COVID, it was more towards survival. So when people became unemployed, um, there were people that began to mobilize themselves and look in the new normal to selling, to, uh, to weaving, and to coming out with cooked food, uh, just so that they could um, get their families to have uh, meals and food on the table. And when you, when I looked at the preparing for this um, um, this presentation, a story that came to mind about how women leadership and mobilization is great is when um, when the, um, the whole world was um, able to declare that um, on the 11th of March uh, the pandemic it has become a global issue. Um, one particular mother here in Fiji, uh, in the midst of her uh, roles and, and duties, decided to, to prepare her own family uh, with groceries and shopping and in, in her uh, mind and in her preparation was for rainy days. Um, looking at the motherly role in that particular home, um, her son saw her preparing these groceries in containers and uh, immediately reacted uh, to the mother and, uh, by saying, where are you putting these two containers to? Who are you gifting these groceries to? And the mother um, in response said, it is for our rainy days as a family. And obviously the young man did not really understand, but here the mother had already seen ahead. And of course, in the experience of Fiji, it was eight days or a week later that our first COVID case was, uh, was uh, declared. Our mother's roles are important also, or women roles are important. And we see the leadership in mobilizing um, our communities, coming out strongly when COVID, um, when children were taken back to school and during this whole pandemic, the mother's club became very active. Women mobilized the, um, the catering in the schools to assist those children that were not uh, able to uh, have proper meals from home. And a lot of those that came into helping out in the communities were were, were women themselves. And these were really uh, groups that were women led and uh, educators, and they dominated this space of reaching out in charity and feeding um, the children out at the different schools. Um, it's not a new role for women to be cleaning and teaching and singing. Even in the church, they were, women leadership is very strong in leading and coordinating these areas. And of course, in the cultural groups, uh, where we have women participation and leadership. Um, they are very strong around the secretariat and coordinating areas um, towards cultural revival, uh, towards uh, storytelling and educating children um, and coming up as front, uh, frontliners in teaching and learning of life skills where their children and uh, our communities were concerned. And uh, something that uh, we noticed that the groups that were led by women um, in pre-COVID uh, time, as soon as it was uh, declared a pandemic in the world, some of these groups uh, um, where women led immediately seized all cultural activities and uh, they were asked to, the communities or the members were asked to prioritize and prepare their families uh, towards what is ahead. And that was before Fiji declared its uh, first um, uh, COVID case. Uh, unfortunately, um, in terms of the higher hierarchical areas of our levels of decision making in our own indigenous cultures in Fiji, and I'm um, making reference mainly to the Rotuman community, which is um, 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 matrilineal, and the, and the Itoke uh, indigenous community, which is patrilineal. Whichever the communities, women um, were not really Pres their presence were not always in the higher hierarchical levels of decision-making. 
Um, in terms of challenges in leadership uh, uh, during this uh, pandemic, we, we look, we, I realized that um, the challenges came about in terms of women leadership in the multitasking that women leaders had to do at home and in the workplace, as well as in the community. They took on more uh, roles uh, that, than before because uh, when they were locked down, uh, the experiences were uh, more and more of the home environment duties of nurturing and uh, the kitchen hand and um, and working out in in the home space uh, fell on working women themselves uh, during the lockdown there were women leaders um, that were working from home but um, they did not escape the the tasks that were home um, some of the issues that we experienced uh, or that is in our um, our um, records here in fiji is that um, during the pandemic the domestic violence uh, figures rose uh, during the pandemic, for example, the Women Crisis Center uh, declared uh, that um, uh, more and more women were coming in because they were abused they, uh, more on violence and sexual abuse as well. Our government uh, helplines recorded uh, 87 calls. Um, uh, in the call lines for the month of February, and then it rose to 187 in, Fiji, uh, in April, and then further uh, in May to 500 calls. And 66% of these were callers. It was all around the violence and uh, the sexual abuse uh, um, um, uh, impact on, on the women that were at home, and of course, children too. Uh, the other challenges that women faced were around expectations at the workplace. Um, the expectations were, became higher as things became difficult. Uh, expectations from those in governance, expectation from their own colleagues, expectations in the beneficiaries that they were serving uh, and in partners. The pandemic sold to a lot of uh, uh, needs, a lot of survival needs uh, that people were experiencing. And so as women lead leaders, um, these expectations became um, a real um, area of, uh, of a challenge for us uh, as women leaders. Uh, the expectations also grew from the families because it came from spouses, children, and extended family members because most of our communities here, are also, uh, our families are also around our commun uh, extended family uh, com uh, homes. And so these expectations of the roles and responsibilities grew as things became more difficult. Uh, cultural roles and expectations of women. In, in, um, in our community here, uh, the, one of the biggest challenges was uh, around the, you know, the expectation of you, not only as a working mother, but you are supposed to be a nurturer, you are supposed to be a passive partner, uh, a kitchen hand. And these things are sometimes instilled in our children as they are growing around some of our uh, education uh, uh, environment. I um, note a particular complaint that came with uh, through a woman activist in Fiji last year when she alerted people to the uh, to the uh, to our year uh, eight uh, health uh, or well-being book that really enforced this type of thinking around the children and they were studying this in schools. Um, then there's the lack of support by other women leaders. Um, the, one of the experiences that we, we, we have also is around our professional spaces where women um, in governance are not able to support uh, those management levels, and 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 then we move on to uh, other outside community spaces where it it continues to become a reality for women leaders. Um, and the final challenge that I highlighted here is that um, people need to walk and and uh, talk and practice what we are putting out to children. Um, and then during the pandemic, I think one of the stories that we were able to pick up was uh, in this particular home uh, of a of a woman. Um, the community leader, when she realized that she has, she was spending more time addressing um, and reaching out to the communities in need, uh, she came home one day to see toilet rolls, you know, used sparingly and all over her place. So uh, one of the immediate uh, responses she was um, that she did with her family was to call them one by one, issue them a bathing soap and a roll of toilet paper and then reminded them to use that sparingly, that there was no more common use of their tissues. They were to learn by 
using their own and when they are done they bring it back before the new ration is given because in some of the homes the the, the children uh, some children did not really get affected uh, they are lucky in this case a few of them never really got to face the pandemic uh, uh, impact uh, in terms of survival, uh, while there were others in the community that um, uh, that went through and continue to go through struggling moments of survival. Um, the learnings uh, during the crisis for uh, for for me in terms of uh, looking ahead and and calling on an equitable future, uh, I think one is the, uh, one would be the need for teamwork. Uh, the need for us to work as a collaborative group uh, at home, at work and in the community to share loads and responsibilities. Um, during COVID and, um, and also in, in the lockdown stages, uh, while most offices were closed and all, our Caritas Fiji office was still operating. Uh, and I recall clearly in TC Yasa, because our power lines were still open, our staff continued in the middle of the cycle to be corresponding, uh, to be meeting and to be writing proposals for immediate response on the ground. And we are very grateful to our partners in Oceania, um, Caritas Australia and Caritas New Zealand, and also our extended partners, the Catholic Relief Services staff, for continuing to reach out with us and, and for making, you know, um, uh, the, and giving us the support we needed in this time. And this made things uh, a lot more easier with that peer support and guidance. Um, there's also the learning that we need to take heed of uh, warning seriously. Um, things, uh, I think women leaders tend to note this and uh, tend to move a lot faster and uh, note information of disaster and pandemic and, and to be able to mobilize their groups and members uh, a lot more faster than others. And we feel that this is an, um, one of the biggest learning. And I think in terms of uh, the, the community, in terms of our, our group, we were well prepared to respond to people after after the uh, some of our disaster experiences. The the other learning was to be always to be prepared and to expect the unexpected or the worst in any situation. And I think um, uh, for our women leader experiences, uh, most, I mean, I'm talking women leaders because a lot of our CSOs and uh, NGO sectors, um, communities and organizations are women led. And the issue of resilience and adaptability is uh, not only in through the organizations that we partner with, but also with the women in the communities. Uh, where they are able to adapt quickly to the new changes, to the new experiences and the communities and, um, and mobilize things in their own home, community to get, particularly I'm um, continue to speak to, you know, to, to help with the uh, poverty rates and the unemployment, increasing unemployment rates and to fend for their families. Um, another learning is to listen to others. I think um, it's always important that um, in our learning as the leaders, that we listen to the experts regardless of the age. Um, and, and in here, our elders, they, uh, they are able to detect warning signs. Uh, and a lot of what we do or can do in, in, in our Oceania experiences are not explained in books. There are people among us that are able to help us with, uh, with uh, you know, warnings, with guidance, and we need you know, to also take heed of their, their support. Leadership is also through experience and uh, by choice. Uh, it is reflected in how you organize oneself and, uh, and the decision to, do, to, to continue to be a leader. Um, the experience for us as women can be very, uh, is very challenging and um, the situations we are put into, we have to be resilient and able to adapt. And sometimes it's, uh, it's a bit um, uh, difficult when you come to be able to, uh, when you come to be helping and reaching out to others. Uh, but I believe that uh, leadership is through experience and this is your once exposure to both traditional and Western education, uh, to the different areas and levels in community. And the, the decision to become a leader and to choose to be a leader is something that falls back in the individual. And this is something that we realize that um, in our a small team, we have to, uh, we, we need to experience this and continue to uh, lead by that. Um, in looking forward uh, to what 
care of the future holds and how we can promote more, more women uh, leadership positions uh, and in Oceania and in Fiji uh, is to partner and network with those that are able to help and to share their way. And this is, I think, a way to begin from. And the partnership and networking is also for peer learning, is also for mentoring. And this can be uh, attained not only within our spaces in our country, but is found in the whole Caritas network across Oceania and across the, um, the uh, Caritas internationally. And I think that the forums like this and the spaces where women are sharing and those that have uh, shared before me have uh, really given a lot of insights and, uh, and you know, inspiration uh, to me as a leader to continue to work and, and move forward. Um, there's also the need to encourage and support women in leadership. I believe that um, there's a need for our people here in, in, in our spaces, in our country, that when a woman is given a position of leadership, that they be given the opportunity, be trusted with the roles and the responsibility and in the learning to be guided through um, uh, with these particular roles. The exposure to wider life experiences um, is, is important. We, I believe the different areas of life skills and um, uh, are important regardless and learning from the different hierarchical structures that we have. Um, I, like I continue to uh, say, the best answers are not just learned from the books, um, even the best leadership skills, but through the application that one is able to put in the various contexts that we operate and, and, and live in. Um, the contexts in which we have in Fiji uh, may be slightly different from our, our, um, our members in the other Pacific Islands. And there's a lot of exchange and learning that we can do. And so I think that uh, women leaders um, that are exposed to these wider experiences at home, the community and in the various um, areas uh, or levels are able to uh, continue to give back uh, a, a lot better into their um, uh, management and coordination of the groups that they lead. Something that I also um, hear strongly from uh, Martha and I believe is true is the orientation of leaders at all levels. And when we are, there is um, um, a new um, community or even uh, those that have been developed, there's always this um, need for learning and relearning and looking at policies and procedures and, uh, and uh, things that can help um, you know, orient us into the roles, the different roles we play at governance level, at management level. And this is true for any Caritas family. This is also true for any CSO and NGO sectors, because this is an area that, um, that is uh, um, uh, a concern for some of us as leaders here in our local communities. The other is to educate our males because we live in a patriarchal society or dominated by patriarchal um, norms and expectations. Um, and, and, and this is not because the society is just patriarchal. Um, I come from a cultural uh, society that's matrilineal, but the need to educate our males to support and encourage women in leadership at all levels is something that is needed for the future, uh, for us to be able to open and clear spaces for women leaders. Um, at, as the hierarchy gets higher, uh, women presence gets uh, lower. And um, this is uh, important. When and we educate our males to support and encourage because we need these males that are already in leadership um, uh, to continue to help. And I think uh, Monsignor uh, also uh, um, alluded us to that. Uh, finally, in terms of suggestion is the need for us to stand in solidarity with other women leaders. I sometimes in my experiences find that women uh, ourselves contribute to the disempowerment of other women leaders. And I believe this is an area that can change and needs to change for the future if we are going to empower and have more women leaders. And the, the learning and the empowering uh, needs to be begin uh, early, but um, those of us that are already in leadership um, uh, positions, we need to be there and to stand in solidarity um, as we continue to advocate for peace and, and for justice 
uh, we need to ensure that our other women counterparts are not experiencing uh, things that we are trying to advocate publicly. So um, this is the sharing I have for the moment. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to um, share from Oceania and from Fiji and the experiences that uh, I'm able to uh, bring out to our space of discussion this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agatha. Thank you a lot for your presentation, for uh, the lessons learned, for your proposition as well. Uh, now I will leave the floor to the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Trocare, uh, Quiva Dibara. I hope that I've pronounced your name correctly. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rita, and you pronounced my name perfectly. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I won't be very long, but I would like to ask everybody a favor. If your bandwidth allows, could you put your camera on? So if, if you can't do that, that's fine for whatever reason. But it is actually very disempowering for people to speak to a screen full of black boxes and names. And it is lovely to see all of those friendly faces that are now starting to pop up on the screen. So that is one thing that I would say we have the advantages and the disadvantages of working in this COVID era. But one of the big advantages is being able to network with each other and to get to know each other across this fabulous Caritas uh, network. And now I feel so much more ready to speak, seeing lovely smiling faces in front of me. So I will be brief. There were three questions we were asked to, to address in this. One was, uh, what were the challenges in the leadership position during the pandemic? Um, well, let me start with what worked, because the challenges were many. And I think we all experienced challenges, some similar, some a bit different. But for, for me as the leader of my organization, which for those of you who don't know, Troker is the Irish Caritas. We, we don't work in Ireland. We only work overseas. We work in between 17 and 20 countries on development and humanitarian work. Um, so what worked? At the senior leadership team level and at the levels of teams below us, there was a very strong level of trust and cohesion. And this has been built up over years. It's part of the culture, but you really know you have it when it's apparent during times of crisis. And it just shows the value of investing in relationships, investing in people, investing time in getting to know each other and supporting each other in different human ways. The second piece that worked was communication. I read an article in maybe McKinsey or Harvard Business Review about three months into the COVID crisis. And it said, as the CEO, you are probably feeling like you're the chief information officer. And if you're not, you're not doing your job properly. So I think as CEO, as leaders, it was so important to be communicating clearly consistently and not just communicating what we knew and decisions that were being taken but what we didn't know and giving people a sense of timeline when will we come back and communicate more to you and um, but not over promising either and that increased the trust and the level of confidence that everybody in the organization had that the leadership was in control not in control of things that we could not control in our environment but in control of things we could control as an organization and I think the last thing that worked was that the organization was, while I wouldn't say prepared for something like a COVID pandemic, had put in the hard work of being prepared for other risks. And this meant that going into the COVID crisis, we had already identified and started working on other risks that if we hadn't worked on them would have really exacerbated and increased the impact of the pandemic. So for example, our financial sustainability, we had a process in place to make sure that was sound, um, our staffing and our structures, our country operating model review. We had already embarked as every organization needs to do periodically on processes to make sure we were sustainable. And this fact that we had not ignored smaller problems meant that when a bigger problem came, we were better able to handle it. Now, um, what has any of this got to do with gender equality and gender equity? Well, really what it has to do with it is that, um, as Martha said, um, as Agatha a minute ago, leadership comes from experience and comes from choice. So the leadership team at the most senior table, but also leadership teams at other tables throughout the whole structure had been given opportunities to work through crises to manage problems before and had been supported to do that, including myself. So if female leaders are given exposure to challenging situations, 
given responsibility in a supportive way, there is no limit to what those female leaders can achieve. And I think that shone through four of the six members of the executive leadership team in my organization are women. And those four had by and large been tried and tested through previous difficult situations, crisis, change management. So investing in people's capacity to manage change, manage it well, not protecting people from making difficult decisions, but supporting them to do so is really important. Other than more, I guess other people have talked about some of the challenges around the gender perspective in, in moving through the crisis. So our organization is 70% female, both at home and in all of the country offices that we work for. The profile of staff is very diverse. Um, so you couldn't really say, you know, that women experienced one thing and men another. But one of the things is that we have a lot of women who have young children in the organization and many of those women are in middle management roles. So in some respects, they experienced the worst of the crisis, both at home because of their responsibilities as mothers and at work because they were caught between delivering decisions that were being made higher up that they were consulted on but not authorized to take and supporting their teams. So being conscious of the burden on people in those situations was absolutely pivotal and working to help them identify what they need and what, they, what we could enable them to do through more flexible work practices, through changing priorities, through changing the way we worked physically and process-wise, that was absolutely crucial for everyone, but particularly for people who had um, many, many responsibilities, including, of course, the responsibility of caring for aging and vulnerable parents. Um, you know, what we discovered was that, you know, while we believe that our organization is pretty strong in terms of gender equality and that Ireland has certainly come a long way on gender equality, all of the old known norms and social issues, they still exist somewhere in the background. So one example, a relatively junior member of staff whose role is still pivotal in the organization, just casually mentioned over a tea break or coffee conversation recently that her husband works upstairs in the bedroom or the spare room and she works downstairs. Now, where are the children? The children are downstairs. So, you know, upstairs, downstairs, power dynamics at home in the household, power dynamics around who has access to the quiet space, who has access to the resources, that really matters. Also, you know, when we all quickly overnight had to work from home, there was no problem for the senior managers. I have a laptop. There was no problem for the people in the senior technical roles who travel a lot. They have laptops, they had the peripherals, they were able to work from home immediately. The people who found it much more difficult were the people in the lower levels of the organization whose work involved them coming into the office five days a week and who had a PC, they had a hard drive. You know, These things that now we consider to be so outdated that we would never give anybody one again because they can't work flexibly with them. And it took us time to respond to people. And like in most organizations, right, we're 75% female, but at those lower levels, we're more like 80 or 85% female. So women at the lower levels of the organization had less, less access to the technology and tools to do their jobs. And typically, often they had more responsibility for home life as well. So addressing the things that were in our control as an organization was incredibly important because we can't account for everybody's different home situation, of course. Um, there's a positive dimension though. The positive perspective on it is that overnight and for the past year, we have experienced a much more level playing field across the whole organization. So we work in 19 different jurisdictions. We were able to overnight bring people into management forums that influenced important decisions, no matter what country in the world they were in or what time frame. Typically, what we would do is once a year, bring just the country directors back to HQ. And when they're in headquarters, we have important discussions. It lasts a whole week. It's incredibly intense. And then they go back and they tell everybody in the field offices what those decisions were and how they impact on them. This time around, we've done it completely differently. And in maintaining that will be so important because all of a sudden, the senior members of the management teams in every country are part of the leadership forum. They have an equal voice and an equal share and an equal responsibility in the discussions that lead to decisions at the leadership forum level. A strategic planning workshop, which again, typically would be 17 country directors and maybe 25 senior leaders back in HQ, that was opened up to 90 people whose contributions because of their diversity 
and their truth were essential. So the organization has changed and every organization has changed. You can bring in the diverse voices from across the organization and create a level platform if you really try hard, because like in any other forum, there will be quieter voices and louder voices. So it's really important to ensure that the way you set up your workshops on Zoom is just as it's just as important to make sure they're participatory and equal share of voices considered as if you're in a room together. So um, but the opportunity to do that across a range of different countries and locations is absolutely fantastic. And it's, it's really important because it can empower people, not just in the here and now, but also to, to fulfill career paths in the organization. Because one of the truths, it's an unfortunate truth, but it is a truth, is that the closer somebody is to the center of power, the more likely they are to rise through the organization because you're more visible you have more interactions with the decision makers. You're better known to the people who are making higher decisions. They have trust in you. You're a known quantity. And just our inherent tendency as human beings is therefore to give people roles when we know they can do the job. OK, so by having this more open platform or more level playing field, we can actually see the talent in the organization much more clearly. And many more people over the last year have progressed into more senior roles from the countries that they are in, roles have moved out from HQ. A role doesn't necessarily need to be in Ireland or Norway or Brussels anymore. It can be in the country the person is living in as long as we can pay taxes and run payroll. So we have really changed lots of things and brought lots of people with fabulous talent and skills upwards in the organization, which is really good. And amongst them, many women. But maybe and I'm going to finish in this section. The last question was, what can we do more as Caritas and as Caritas agencies on women in leadership? Well, the first thing is really to see where are we now? So throughout this process, this past year, many organizations, I'm sure, including your own, will have done surveys at different points to find out specific information. How are people coping? What do people need? What's people's experience? Often we do staff engagement surveys, maybe every year, maybe every two years. It's really important to pay attention to the gender differential in those surveys and to ask questions that draw out the different experience of men and women in your organization. And then if you find there's a differential, well, talk to people, do a little focus group. Well, what is the reason behind this experience? And is it a concern for the organization or is it something we just don't have control over? but really understanding the different experiences of men and women is really important because if you don't understand it, if you don't see it, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, I think the other thing is just to recognize as leaders, the historical inequity, the patriarchy that's built into every culture we're in. I was a bit shocked to hear um, our, our colleague from Norway talking about the gender pay gap in Norway. I thought Norway would be, you know, way better, Martha, way better than, than my country, but no, it just demonstrates that this is, um, this is global, this issue. Um, so recognizing historical disadvantage around gender. Now, in some cultures and contexts that might, the gap might've closed more than in others. But what it means is that we have to open our eyes to the broader equity, equality, diversity, and inclusion issues, because as sure as I'm sitting here in front of you, there is discrimination and marginalization and prejudice, and it's transversal. It affects different groups of people in different way, but there are groups who are marginalized and whose experiences and opportunities are lesser than others in every environment. And in addressing gender inequality, it's really important to look at inclusion in a broader sphere as well, because you might find, oh, our organization is okay, 66% of our leadership are women, women are getting opportunities. Okay, fine. Okay, what about people of color? What about LGBTQ communities? What about people with disabilities? Are we really inclusive? Are we really creating inclusive environments where everybody feels that they can participate equally and be respected, have their voices heard and progressed? I think that's one thing because of Black Lives Matter, because of shifting the power, because of the localization agenda that's really come to the fore through this COVID crisis. And we have an opportunity as leaders to really make progress on that. Um, and then I think something that, that's another thing that um, I think it was Agatha said, um, we do need to, um, we need to provide spaces for peer support for women. So first of all, you need to provide pathways for women to progress into more senior roles. I'll diverge a little bit here because everybody needs to figure out what the motorbike is in their organization. So I worked for three years in an organization in Malawi. It was quite operational and we employed a lot of field workers. And in one district, the district coordinator identified that 
while he knew that the technical college was producing about as many female agricultural field workers as male agricultural female field workers, none of the women were applying for jobs in our organization. And he's like, why? So he sat down with the job description and the ad and said, okay, what if we change this, this, and this? And the key piece that he changed in that ad was the requirement to have a motor, motorbike license to the requirement to be willing to learn to ride a motorbike. OK, so what are the things in the way that we advertise, the way that we send messages around our organization, what it's like to work in our organization that makes a woman go, ah, uh -uh, I don't have a motorbike license. I can't apply for that job. OK, so what's the equivalent for us? So we need to think all of those things through and make it easier and more acceptable for women to put themselves forward for for senior jobs. And then when they get the senior jobs, support them. Unfortunately, again, women are culturally conditioned not to be abrasive, not to be aggressive. But what that actually means is that women are culturally conditioned to have less voice and less influence. And that's just insupportable. That's intolerable in today's world. So we need to support women through coaching, mentoring, peer support, and also all of those other formal supports that women need to feel the confidence in their own skills that they have. And the last thing I'll say is that change doesn't happen without intention and without accountability. So in our organizations, we need to say, what's our vision? What do we want to change? What are we going to measure? And who are we accountable to? And then make sure that we deliver against that. And if we do that, we will achieve an awful lot of change, not just in gender equality, but across a whole lot of other areas that are important to us in terms of our values base. I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Kuiva. Thank you for uh, for your presentation, for uh, presenting challenges, but as well as uh, proposing solutions at the same time. So thank you a lot. I guess due to time limitation, we're gonna take one answer. As there's an answer, as a, one question. There's a question about um, how to change mindset uh, and help women uh, to uh, to be part of a leadership uh, or to gain leadership position. Uh, I will ask Maria to. Uh, to briefly answer these questions and the rest of the questions, if there are any, we will answer them in the next webinar. Maria, the floor is yours. And then back to you, Moira, uh, after Maria. Yeah, thank you so much. But I think there's a, there's a whole wealth of experience in response to that. So perhaps people want to put in their chat as well. What do you think can help you know, change the mindsets, make this cultural change? I think a lot is in um, showing by example. I mean, people need to see this is possible. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that, that also means that there, there is some way because the, very often these, uh, these barriers of, of, of the fear, they get broken down when people see that actually, you know, it wasn't that difficult. It wasn't that, you know, there was nothing really to be afraid of. I think that's one of the, of the, the things I would, that comes to my mind. Um, so, yeah, leading by, showing by example, but uh, I'm sure there is much more uh, into it. So perhaps people want to add to it in the chat. Well, we invite everyone to add their perspective in the chat. Uh, thank you all. It was a wonderful webinar. Uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, Moira, back to you. Rita, my first thank you goes to, to you for moderating this session as well. And uh, we are going towards the conclusion of this third webinar. Uh, thank you to all panelists. Uh, your presentation were really, really inspiring today. Thank you uh, to Monsignor Hector Fabio Enao, uh, who shared with us the great experience uh, of women in Caritas, Colombia. Uh, we did today as well a trip around the world, a very interesting trip with your experiences. And uh, we are going also towards the conclusions of this uh, initiative about women and COVID-19. Next week, on Monday, next Monday, we will have the last webinar of this initiative. And this will be a webinar to wrap up a bit what uh, were the indications, the challenges, the proposals for the future. And today we had uh, a lot of inputs, a lot of inspiration for that. So I give you a rendezvous, an appointment to next Monday. Well, I hope we can have, uh, if available, all the panelists today uh, for this last, mo last moment of sharing. We will have uh, uh, some uh, other
uh, representative of our confederation to share their experience. And we will look at the future together uh, to see how women in this confederation and broadly in the world uh, can really uh, be a lever of a new development, uh, a lever of a new uh, beginning uh, after COVID-19. Again, thank you very much to all. Thank you very much without uh, forgetting uh, uh, anyone, to all the panelists, to uh, Ria, the moderator, to Maria, Monsignor Hector Fabio, to uh, Marta Skretberg, uh, to Quiva, Agatha, Sister Maria, and uh, I hope that uh, I didn't forget uh, any, anybody. Thank you again and see you next Monday. <laughs> Thank you. No. Thank you.